In this video, we will look at Factory Talk Batch from a user's perspective. Factory Talk Batch is the most comprehensive batch process solution in our offering. It enables you to create, modify, and run recipes that define the processing steps to be undertaken, as well as defining the values or formulation to be used, without having to have any PLC or DCS programming skills. It can be equally used upon simple batch plants, where things are made in standalone vessels, as well as complex plants, where things are made in multiple stages across many vessels, for example, pre-mixers, reactors, and filter dryers. The processing steps, or equipment phases as they are known, can both be automated, i.e. executed by a PLC or DCS controller, or manual, i.e. executed by a person. Factory Talk Batch was designed around the ISA S88 Batch Control Standard and helps encourage following this best practice in its implementation. Let's start by running an existing recipe and looking at the user interfaces available for Factory Talk Batch. On the screen at the moment, we're looking at the user interface that is integrated into Factory Talk View Site Edition. This allows you to look at both what's going on in the process and what's going on within Factory Talk Batch. There is also a web browser interface available. This uses HTML5 technology, so it's available on both Windows, iOS devices such as iPads and iPhones, and Android devices such as an Android phone or tablet. It allows you to connect to Factual Batch using standard web technology and, and see the same, same interface. So let's log in and see what that looks like with the web in browser interface. As you can see, the interface here looks identical to the interface that you see in the integrated environment. The interface lets you um, respond to any prompts that the fact.batch may be asking the operator. It looks, lets you look at any batches currently on the list to run or that are running, and currently we don't have any. It lets you look at the equipment configured in fact.batch and lets you manually control that equipment. So from here we can go and look at each of the units in our system. So this is a multi-stage process where we have pre-mixers and reactors. And then we can actually go and look at one of those pre-mixers and we can see those processing steps or equipment phases available on that particular unit. And if we want, we can take ownership of these and we can manually run them. From the diagnostics page, we can see diagnostics about Factual Batch. So we can see the status of Factual Batch and its servers. We can see how the server is doing in terms of its loading. We can test the server and see how it's doing for its communication and check that all communications is good. And if we're running a batch, we can actually see the batch record being created as it's running from here. OK, so let's actually place a recipe into the batch system and run it. So from the integrated user interface, shall go into the batches section and then I shall suggest add a batch to run. Here we can see a list of the available recipes that have been created that I can select from on the system. So I'm going to select one of these recipes. This recipe has automatic batch ID generation so the ID up here was automatically generated. Um, I can choose with batch to have it automated um, and not be able to change it to be manual or it can be automated and changeable. Here we have batch scaling. So in a batch recipe, you can specify that some of your values or formula parameters can be scalable. If they are scalable, then if I put 200 in this box here, it will double those values. And if I put 50 in here, it will half them. Here we can see a description of the recipe that was created by the recipe creator. And then we get down to the unit bindings. So one key feature of Factual Batch is you can have class-based recipes. This means that if you, in your plant, had multiple pieces of equipment that can do the same thing, so let's say in our plant we had three mixers, and each make, mixer can make the same product, we can write a recipe once, and that recipe can run on any of those mixers. Here I've got a recipe that has to run on a pre-mixer, um, and I can choose any of my pre-mixes in the plant to run it on. I'm going to choose the first one, 
And again, you can have logic being factored at batch that makes a selection for you based on some conditions. Finally, I then have some things which I specified in the recipe have to be asked on recipe creation. So for this recipe, I have to specify how much I'd like to make. So let's say we'd like to make 100 kilograms and then accept our options. As you can see, you have confirmation that you want to proceed, so we'll agree to that. And now we can see on our batch list, we just have one batch listed. If we were to repeat that process and very quickly accept the defaults, then you can see that we now have two batches. So you can have multiple batches in the batch system. Um, they can either be ready to run or running or completed, and you can have multiple batches running in parallel. Let's select our first batch what we've created, and here we can now see the details of that recipe. So here we see it in a sequential flowchart view, so we can see each of those process steps, the equipment phases. If we click on a step, we can see the details in the recipe for that step. So here we're running the charge equipment phase. We can see that we have DI water selected, and we're going to charge 100 kilograms. Okay, and if we have a look at another charge, then we can see that that now changes to acid. From this view, we can start the recipe. Um, we can switch it into manual mode and manually step through. We can switch it into semi-automatic, where the batch system will not move on until we allow it to do so. And we can also put the recipe into total manual control, and step back into a previous step, and start and stop each step manually. So let's have a look at this now in the web interface. The web interface, again, if we go into the batches area, we can see we have the same two recipes listed. And if we go and have a look at that recipe, then we can see we see the same detail, just with more space on the screen because we have a larger view area available. The web interface is intelligent, so if we make our web browser smaller, then it will automatically resize as appropriate. So you can see that it will work on a mobile phone and it supports you um, pinch zoom to zoom in and out. It supports um, touch and grab to scroll around the recipe. So let's now run our recipe from Factory Talk View. So we go back to our graphic and we select Start and we'll watch this recipe run through the plant. Okay, so now we're on to the charge step of our recipe. We can see that the fractal batch operator interface shows us that we're now in the charge step, highlighted in green. And if we go and select that step, we can then see the details. We can see over on the right that the charge phase is running. The valve for water has opened, and the charge equipment phase is now charging that DI water into the premixer. If we go and have a look at the reports for this step, and we can see that when that equipment phase completed, it reported these values back to Factual Batch, and Factual Batch has recorded those. Our recipe is now moved on, so let's scroll through and move down our recipe to see where we are. We can, if we wish, hide the parameters and reports view, so we can just look at the recipe. Okay, so here we can see we've now moved on to the second stage of the charge, and if we go and have a look in the web interface, we can see that it's showing us exactly the same information. Now, in this step of the recipe, um, the recipe creator has configured uh, this step to ask the operator how much to charge rather than specify that amount in the recipe. This has now created a batch prompt. So as you can see on the top left here, we have prompts being highlighted with one prompt for us to answer. We also have the prompt button over on the right flashing away to highlight to the operator that there's a prompt that needs our attention. So let's go and have a look at that prompt. This again brings up the integrated Fracture Talk batch control in the Fracture Talk View Site Edition environment, but this time it's been set to just show prompts rather than the entire Fracture Talk batch interface. So we can just see the prompts available to us in here. We can see that we have one prompt where we're being asked to enter a value for the set point charge and which recipe is asking for it. And if we go and click on it, we can then see the details. Um, so here we can see um, the particular batch, the batch ID for that batch, the recipe that's running, the unit that's on it, the default value, 
um, and it's asking us then to either change that value or acknowledge and accept the default. But if we go and have a look in the web interface, we can see that it is exactly the same. OK, so let's go back to our recipe view in the web interface, and then our batch talk view will accept the default and allow the recipe to proceed. Now we have accepted the default value, the charge is using that amount. If we want, we can then look at the values for that and confirm that we can see the 50 kilogram default is now being used. We've now moved on in the recipe. We're showing another feature here where you can read tag values from your controllers, PLC or DCS, and use that to make decisions in the recipe. So here we read the weight in the premixer, and based on the weight, we decided do we need to mix it for 10 or 20 seconds. That's now completed, and we've now moved on to another prompt. Here we've got an example of another type of prompting that you can do. So here we've actually written an equipment phase for prompting. The recipe specifies the message to ask the user. So if we click on prompt here and we have a look, we can see that it's saying um, to ask the operator, do you want additional agitation? Okay. Based on the answer then, the recipe can do two different things. It can either continue if no additional agitation is required, or it can agitate for a bit longer and then ask the operator again. You can see on the right here, we have our prompt equipment phase flashing away, saying that it needs our attention. When we click on that, we can see the message from the recipe and we can give our answer. So I'm going to select no, and then we're going to move on. OK, so so far in this demonstration, every equipment phase that's been running, each of those processing steps, has been an automated step. So it's had automated valves, pumps and motors being controlled by a PLC or DCS controller um, to execute that process step. And um, fact, short batch has been starting and stopping them in those controllers as required with their required values. But fact, short batch can also um, <clears throat> support manual procedures. This feature is called eProcedure. So here we have a manual procedure that the operator needs to execute. Um, and again, you can see that we have a prompt asking us to respond. So let's go and have a look at our prompt in the prompt view. Again, we can see that we now have um, some instructions that we need to follow as a prompt. And if we click on those, we can then see the details of our manual procedure. So here we have the e-procedure. Okay, you can have as many steps as you like. Here we have four different steps. It uses standard web-based HTML5 technology. So that means whatever you can display in a HTML5 web page, you can display in an e-procedure. So here you can see that we have text, we have pictures, um, you can have PDF instructions, you can have videos if you wish to explain and show what each operator needs to do. So let's follow this manual procedure. So here in the first step, it's being asked us to go and find the right manhole and go and open it. Confirm that you've opened it, so I shall open it, and confirm that, and then click yes. In the second step, we're now being asked to add material. Now the amount of material to add and the um, lots number of the material has come from the recipe. So these are not um, defined in the web page and therefore can't change. These values are dynamic. The same for the batch ID. This is a dynamic value that will change every time the recipe um, runs. Okay. Let's go and have a look at the web interface and see what e-procedure looks like in that. So again, we can see that we have a prompt sitting at the top here. And we have a manual procedure that we need to follow. And we can see that at the moment um, we've got one step completed, two steps to do. And as you can see, you have exactly the same interface. So on your tablets, on your mobile phones, um, you can have these procedures. So you could use a ruggedized tablet or an ATEX ruggedized tablet in a process area to follow an e-procedure. From this interface then, let's actually say we're going to acknowledge that we've done that addition.
Now in this step, we're required to sign. So in these <coughs> e-procedures, you can require signatures for a step to be completed. And these signatures um, can require between one, two, or three different users to type in their usernames and passwords to confirm that a step has been completed. In this case, we just have a single signature required. The operator needs to sign that they've done it. <clears throat> so I shall sign away as a batch operator that I have completed this with my username and password. Um, and I shall fill in a comment. Again, those comments can be <clears throat> optional, they can be compulsory, or you can have no comment required. So now I've filled in my signature, I shall sign, <coughs> confirm the signature. My step shows the signature has completed. And then we move on to the next step. Let's go back to our integrated interface in Factory Talk View. And again, you can see it's showing the same information. So I'm going to move down to the next step where I'm being asked to go and close the manhole cover. I confirm that I have done that. And then we move on to the final step. So an e-procedure is not just about instructing people to do things um, and perhaps recording your signature that they've done them. You can also use it to collect information from the user. Okay. So here we're being asked to confirm which way scale was used. The system knows because we're running on this particular premixer, there's only three way scales we can choose from. So we can go and choose the way scale that we've used. This asks us to record the lot number of the material that we added, and that could be filled in by barcode scan of that um, bag that was used. But I shall manually type it in. And we're being asked to confirm the quantity that was added. Um, this entry can be intelligent, so you can set up limits. So on this particular one here, I've set up that if the amount added was more than 2% from the amount asked to add, you would again require a signature before you could proceed. Um, but let's just put in a value that is within 2% and confirm that step. And now our manual procedure has completed. There's no more prompts for us to follow. And if we go back to our fracture default view display, then you can see we've now moved on to the next step in our recipe which is to transfer out the made material into the reactor. OK, so our recipe has now completed. The green box has moved from transfer out. And if we go back to our batch list, we can see that that recipe has completed. And we now have another recipe ready for us to start. If we wanted to, we could have started all the recipes in the recipe list, um, and it would have run them one after the other. Um, so this second recipe would have automatically been started as soon as the first recipe had completed. Everything undertaken by Batch to execute recipes is recorded by Batch in a batch record for each batch. This is provided with standard out-of-the-box reports. So let's go and have a look at those reports now that we, for the recipe that we've just run. Those are reports, again, are accessed in a standard web browser. <clears throat> and they use a technology called Microsoft Reporting Services. Here you can see the default out of the box reports available with Factual Batch, as well as one custom report that I've created, just to show you that you can take these reports as templates um, and use them to make your own reports, or you can start from scratch and create your own reports. The first report is the batch listing. So this just shows you the batches that have run in your system by default in the last 24 hours. You can change the time periods at the top there. And you can also filter by specific recipe names. Here you can see that we've run so far in the last 24 hours two recipes. The next report then is the batch summary. So this just gives you a summary of the report. So here you can see at the top um, details of the batch ID, the unique ID that the system gave. So every recipe that you run gets a unique ID, the name of the recipe, um, where that recipe was ran, um, its final status, which in this case was complete, when it started and finished, and how long it took. You can then see for each of those equipment phases, the processing steps, when they started and stopped, and how long they took. And at the bottom here, you can also see 
the set point and actual summary. So for each of those equipment phases where they were given a set point um, and they report the actual amounts that they then actually added, such as the charge phase in our example, you can see the amounts that were specified by the recipe, the actual amounts that they reported back, and the deviations. Very useful to see if a batch is within your acceptable tolerances. The next report is the batch detail report. So this gives you all the detail of a batch execution. So here you can see you have the same header as the batch summary, but now for each of our equipment phases, we see all the details. We see the values that were downloaded to that equipment phase and when it ran, and we see the values they reported back. Now remember that these phases can be automatic or manual. So for the automatic ones, Fractal Batch is sending these values down to a PLC or DCS controller, and it's getting these read back from that controller when it completes. For a manual phase, it's doing that itself. We can move to the second page. Um, then we can see if anything abnormal happened in the batch. So did a failure occur? Did it go into hold? Did the operator put it into manual and repeat a step? Um, you can see any alarms and events. So any alarms on the equipment being used by that batch can be shown in the report. Um, and you can also see if there's any failures. So if any of those phases um, reported an issue, um, then that can be shown there and that will cause the batch to go into hold. And then finally, you have the same set point and actual summary at the bottom. Now let's go and look at material usage. So this report is all about which materials um, have gone into which batches. So if I select acid at the top here, I can see in the last 24 hours where the acid was used um, and in which particular batches, how much and what actual lot IDs were used. Now let's look at forward tracking. So this report is about if I had a particular lot of material, where has that lot been used? So let's select a lot, number one, two, three, four, and then view the report. And here we can see in the last 24 hours that that lot was used in those particular batches. So if you did have a bad or suspect material, you could go and actually see where it was used in your system. Now let's look at the backward track tracing report. So this is the opposite of the forward tracing. Let's go and have a look at a particular batch. And for that batch, it will now tell us the details of the materials. If we show all levels, then we can see the details below. So here we can see the lot IDs of the materials and the amounts that went into that particular batch and which units they were used in. So if you had a bad batch, you can then see which lots of material went in. And then from the <clears throat> forward tracking report, you could see where those lots are used. You could find all the batches that were affected. Okay, the next report is batch execution. So this is about the timing of the batch. So here we can see um, that our batch just had one operation. Um, so this is to do with the recipe. In S88, your recipes can be split into different levels. Um, and we ran a basic recipe that just had a single operation. And in that operation, if we move to the second page, we ran those equipment phases the processing steps. So here we can see each of those equipment phases, how long they ran, and you can see the template here is showing you um, <clears throat> which the names of each of those, so you can see where the time is being used. So here we can see that the manual addition um, was the stage in our recipe that took longest, um, so you can go and look at that and you can just use it to maybe try and improve how fast you can actually make recipes by seeing where the time is being used. Next report is a duration comparison report, and this is all about comparing executions of one batch to another. So in the last 24 hours, so far we've run two batches, um, and the second batch that we ran in this video, as you can see, took longer than the first one that we've run previously, and then you can actually go and look at the details of that batch to see where the time was used. Next report is the batch exceptions. So this is purely a report that just shows you issues that occurred on a batch. As we can see, when we ran our batch, we didn't have any issues, and therefore there's no data available, no issues occurred. Okay. <clears throat> Next report is the operation sequence. Um, if you use sequence te manager technology in um, Logix, um, you can connect batch to run those sequence manager sequences, um, and this report would then show you any of those sequences that ran in your recipe. 
in this demo we didn't do that so therefore our report has none shown. The next report is the event summary so this shows you all the data that is logged in the batch record for a batch. Um, it's very customizable so I can go and say well I'd like to see um, which data I'd like to have a look at so let's select all fields that are available in the database okay then let's go and view the report to update it now we can see all of the columns that are being recorded in our database and each entry as the batch ran so we can see the recipe headers and then we can start seeing um, the message the data coming down from the system when we selected the amount we want to make and if we move to the second page we can then see um, the first equipment phase that ran as the batch started running and um, those equipment phases to the recipe that was specified. A very useful report if you then want to go and see the particular data that's being logged in the database and use it to customize your own reports. The last <coughs> report is then the custom batch detail. So this is to just show you that these reports are open you can open them up and you can modify them. So here I've modified um, the picture on the right to show the Plant PX Duplicity Control System logo um, and I've added additional data to the batch report. So here we've added any signatures so if, if a signature occurred it gives the details of the signature. Okay, So we can see the details of a sign off that happened in a manual procedure here. Um, you can also add comments to a batch as it was running so if the operator had put any comments in they'll be shown in this table and then we go on to the same data as you see in the batch detail. Okay, let's briefly go back then to the integrated user interface in Batch Silk Viewer Site Edition. As I just wanted to add, this layout is um, completely flexible. Here we have an example where we just have one display and we've placed the Fractal Top View user interface on that display with some process graphics. But it doesn't have to be that way. Fractal Top View Site Edition supports pop up displays, so you could have independent pop up windows that pop over your graphics, so you could have all your Fractal Top Batch user interface shown in that way. It also supports multiple monitors. When running Fractal Top View Site Edition on a PC, a thin client or a zero client, you can plug in multiple monitors onto your client. Um, and therefore you can display Fractal.view SE displays on multiple displays. So it could be that you decide to have four monitors connected to your PC and you'll have one monitor um, that maybe shows an alarm list, another one that shows the process graphics in detail, another one that shows the batch list and maybe a final one then that shows the batch prompts for the operator interaction. It's very flexible, um, a, fact, a Windows system can support up to 16 displays um, and we do zero clients that can go up to seven displays. Now let's take a look at how you actually create a recipe in Fracture.batch. The recipe editor that comes with Fracture.batch was designed to be used by process experts and um, chemists for example and doesn't require any DCS or PLC programming skills. We're going to start by opening up the recipe editor and creating a new recipe. So I go into my start menu and I open up my recipe editor. The recipe editor is included in Factual Batch standard. There's just one license of Factual Batch which is based on how many units, how many different pieces of equipment you're going to run your recipes on. Um, so you can place a recipe editor on as many PCs as you like and you, multiple users can be opening up recipes and <clears throat> creating recipes at the same time. So let's create a new recipe. Okay. As I mentioned before, in, in S88 there are three levels of recipe. Okay. And whether you need them or not depends on your process plant. If you had a mixer, for example, and everything occurred in that mixer, all the ingredients went into it, your recipe controlled what happened and the final product came out of it, you would only need an operation. And the operation would contain those processing steps or the equipment phases as they are called um, to create your products. 
If, however, you had a multi-stage process, maybe you had a pre-mixer and you had two of them in your plant where you were pre-mixing materials but then got fed into a reactor where you then did some further reaction, you then moved them into a filter dryer, um, for example, before it went into final product storage, and your recipe controlled what went on in each of those stages, you would then need the high-level recipes. Um, and the reason for this is that an operation can only contain um, equipment phases, and those equipment phases must operate on one unit, such as a premixer. A unit procedure contains operations, so that has a sequence step of operations, but again, those operations can only be on one unit. So maybe I split our recipe up into different operations on a particular premixer, um, adding material, mixing material, for example. The unit procedure would have those two steps, one after the other and the premixer. Finally, I then have a procedure, and the procedure has <clears throat> a sequence of unit procedures. And these can be one after the other, and they can also be in parallel. Um, a procedure can contain unit procedures for multiple units. So the procedure in our example could contain two unit procedures, and one for each of our premixers running in parallel, making material in those two premixers in parallel, um, and then transferring them into our single reactor, where then it moves to just running um, the unit procedure for the reactor. So let's create a base level operation for our example. Um, here we have to give that operation a name, so let's call it demo recipe. Here we have a version number, which can be um, any particular number that we like. Um, the author is the name of the logged in user. Okay, We can give it an optional product code. Let's call it 1254. And if we wish, then we can put in um, a description, an abstract, and a version description for this procedure. I'm just going to put in demo recipe and continue. OK, as you mentioned before, one of the powerful features of Thatch.Batch is if you have multiple pieces of equipment that can do the same thing, maybe I have five mixers and I can make the same product in each of them, I don't have to write the recipe five times. I can write a recipe once that can be run on any of those mixers. This in fact talk batch is called a class-based recipe. Um, so here I'm being asked what type of recipe do I want to write? Do I want to write a class-based recipe that can run on any particular type of equipment? Or do I want to run create an instance-based recipe that can only run on a specific piece of equipment. In my example, I want to create a recipe that can only run on a specific premixer or specific reactor. Let's create a class-based recipe that can run on any premixer in our system. OK, so the recipe editor is now opened, and we have a very basic recipe. We start at the top, true is true, and then we finish. So let's add some processing steps, or equipment phases as we call them, to our recipe. So I'm going to add a step. And when I select I want to add a step, the recipe editor then asks us which ones of our equipment phases would we like to run. And this list is filtered, so I can only select from here things that I can run on my premixer. So let's select the charge equipment phase. I want to charge the material into my premixer. Okay. Then we'll move on and we'll do another charge. Okay. But we'll also, in parallel, do some mixing. So I'll run the agitator at the same time. And then, once I've made my material, let's move it by adding another step into my final product storage by doing a transfer out. Each of these steps <coughs> can have parameters that specify what you want the step to do. So if I click on the step and I click on this button up here, I can then see the available parameters and reports for this particular equipment phase. So for my charge phase, I can see I can specify which material do I want to charge in this step and how much do I want to charge. And I can specify those in different ways. I can directly enter in the value here, hard-coded in the recipe. I can defer it, which means a higher-level recipe would specify it. And if a higher level recipe, such as a unit procedure or procedure, didn't specify it, when I went to go and run this recipe on the batch system, 
the operator will be asked at the start what the value needs to be. Or I can say at the point I run, ask the operator. So as soon as this charge step runs, at that point you see a prompt, such as the example that we saw before. And finally, I can also have an expression. So I can have a calculation. So I can do mathematical calculations, and I can also use values in the recipe. So if I wanted to, in this charge 2 down here, I could base the amount to charge based on the actual amount charged previously, or a tag, such as the pH value I read from my PLC. Let's specify a value. Let's say I want to add water. And let's specify I'm going to add 100 kilograms. Let's move on to our second step. And now let's specify for that that we want to add acid. And let's add 50 kilograms. Okay. If we go and have a look at our agitate step, we can see that there are no parameters. It doesn't require any. And for our transfer out step, there are no parameters. It doesn't require any. As we've been creating this recipe, um, the recipe editor has made some assumptions about how you move from one step to the next. So let's go and look at those and make sure they're correct. These are called transitions. So at the top here, we go from the start of our recipe to the first step. When true is true, it is, yeah, so that is correct. We then go from the first step to the second step when that charge completes. That is correct. Down here at the third transition, um, we move from the charge and agitate running in parallel step to transferring out when both the agitate and the charge complete. Now, this is incorrect. The charge equipment phase does complete. It charges an amount of material, and when it's finished doing it, it will complete. The agitate does not. You tell it to run, um, and there's no point as to when it knows agitation is finished, so it just keeps on running forever. So we have to modify this transition. We do that by double-clicking on it to go into the expression editor. And what we're going to do is remove the agitate complete condition so that as soon as the charge completes, we move on. Batch.batch has intelligence, so when we move on, if the agitator is running, it will command it to stop and reset it before it then continues. The recipe editor has validation in it to validate that you have a valid SFC structure that can run. So let's do that. Okay. And as soon as we do that, then we're asked to provide some comments. So everything that you do in the recipe editor goes into an audit trail. Um, um, here are the messages that are included in that. So we can put in here initial recipe validation. Okay. We're asked if we wish to save that, and as we are saving it, um, we ask for some audit comments for the save. Initial save. Okay. So we validated and verified that SFC. Um, and we have some warnings. Um, those warnings are telling us that at the moment um, the recipe is not released, so it cannot actually be run by any operator on the system. Okay. To show that, um, we've called this recipe demo recipe. And if we go back to our fracture.u interface and we click on our batches here and we say we want to add a recipe, we do not see demo recipe in the list. That recipe is not released. It's not available for someone to select. Okay, and that's what the warning was about. So if we go back into our recipe editor, um, <clears throat> we can then release the recipe. Um, now this can be done in two ways. By default, it's purely a tick box. Okay, I tick the box um, to release this recipe, and I can do it in two ways. I can release it to be used by a high level recipe, so this operation might only be usable by unit procedure but not runnable directly. Or I can release it directly for production, um, or I can do both. Okay. Um, with Fatch.batch, you also have the option to enable <coughs> recipe uh, release signature verification. That means you can have up to five different people, each has to open up the recipe. Um, and if they approve it, type in their username and password. And you can also have an expediter who can override that five different levels. Um, and that has to be done in the order that you specify. 
Okay, so let's release this to production <clears throat> and then save. Again, we're we'll asked for a comment to save it. Release, save. And we'll validate our recipe again. Release, validate. Okay, and now we're just being told that the only warning we have is that it can't be used by another recipe, but it can be used by production. The last thing to say before we actually go and run this recipe is in Factual Batch you can have a um, recipe version control. So by default, the default option out of the box is version control is turned off. You only ever have one version of the recipe. If you go and modify it, that you change that, you lose your previous version. But you can turn on version control, and that means then you have to check out recipes to modify them. When you check them out, you get a new version, so your previous version still exists and can still be used. Um, you create and modify your new version, you can run that to test it, and when you're happy you check it back in, you then have two versions. And if you want, you can then take the first or second version, check that out to make another. So you can have multiple versions of recipes. So let's go and run our demo recipe in Factory Talk View. So we go back to our Factory Talk View screen, we go into our batches list, and now if we go and add our batch, and we can see that the demo recipe is now listed because we released it. We can select that. The system has given it an automatic batch ID. Um, we can, it's asking us for batch scaling, but we didn't specify any of our parameters to be scalable, so that will have no effect. Okay, we can see our recipe description, um, and we can see because it's a recipe that can run on any premixer, we're being asked to select the premixer to use. Let's select the premixer that we're looking at here on this graphic, and then select OK. <clears throat> OK, our recipe is now on the batch list, demo recipe. We can go and look at the details of that recipe, as we saw it in the recipe editor, and we can now run it. So let's run our demo recipe. Here we can see we're in our first step, doing the charge, where we're charging that 100 kilograms of water. And the charge equipment phase is now doing that, following the recipe. Our first charge is now complete, and we've moved on to the second charge. We are now charging acid, 50 kilograms. And at the same time, we're agitating. So you can see that the agitator has started and is mixing the materials together. We've now moved on because the charge completed. As you saw, it's told the agitator to stop as well. And then we've moved on to the transfer out, and we're now transferring our finished product out to the next tank. So our recipe has now completed. We can go back to the batch list and we can see that our recipe is complete. And we can go and look at the details of that in our batch report. So let's go and look at the batch detail for this recipe that we created, which was number 18 that we ran in our system. Here we can see the details of the recipe. So the demo recipe was run and it took 1 minute and 20 seconds. And we can see the details of each of those phases as it ran with those parameters and those values. Um, there's one more thing to mention about the recipe editor that I'd like to show you, so I'm just going to switch back to it. Um, you can have recipe parameters. So for your recipe, you can create parameters for the recipe, um, as well as specifying the parameter values for each of your equipment phases. These have your own names that you specify, so let's, let's create one called make quantity. Okay. What type is it? Is it a, a number that has a, has a decimal place? Is it just a number without a decimal place? It can be a string, or it can be an enumeration, so that can be a selection. Yep. So <clears throat> um, let's go and select um, a material. Yeah. Now here we can specify what type of material that we'd like to make. If we go and change this to a real value. Then we can say what the minimum is that the operator is allowed to enter, 20.0, what the default value is, say 50.0, what the maximum value is, let's say it's 80.0. What units to tell the operator for that particular parameter? Okay. <clears throat> 
and we can have as many parameters as we like. <clears throat> you can use these parameters then in your recipe. So here we've made, got a make quantity here. If I go into my charge equipment phase here and look at the particular step and look at its parameters, I can now say instead of specifying the value here, I'm going to use my recipe parameter, the make quantity. Yeah. So that's how you can have a specific set of parameters um, that you want entered every time at the start of a recipe, or you could use the default values um, <clears throat> for formulations. And this concludes the video. Thank you for watching.